presentation is about. Oh, cool. Okay. Cool. This meeting is being recorded then. So uh, I'm not going to tell my, my lame jokes about the intro again, but I will show you those, those slides again so that you guys can go back and intro slide. It's like two, three, da, 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 da. All right. So hopefully those of you in the future, the time travelers who are viewing this recording, hopefully you've gotten everything just by seeing those slides for a couple seconds here. Let's see. Yep, so we are being recorded now officially. So sensitivity coefficients are a fancy name for relative derivatives. So if we know what kind of change we have in our cross section, say we have an uncertainty in our fission cross section, and we know the sensitivity coefficient, we can propagate that uncertainty through and figure out what kind of uncertainty we have in R, where R is some sort of response in our system. So I mentioned before that I worked at Oak Ridge for a number of years. I worked on a code called Tsunami that calculates sensitivity coefficients. So you'll see a good bit of Tsunami references in this, uh, in this presentation. MCMP also calculates sensitivity coefficients. Serpent also calculates M sensitivity coefficients. OpenMC also calculates them. Um, it's, a, it's a lively field actually with research still ongoing, but people keep, we keep making these advances and then the advance goes into one code and then another person puts it into another code. So we all share the uh, scientific advances. But in general, we can compute sensitivities for eigenvalues. So for R is equal to K effective, and then also for ratios of reaction rates. So sigma one phi over sigma two phi, right? Uh, you can make sigma two phi, you can make sigma two equal to one, and then your response all of a sudden is a multi-group cross-section. You can do all sorts of cool reactor physics uh, studies now that you know the uncertainty in your multi-group cross-section. But the idea is that we propagate uncertainty in input parameters, primarily nuclear data, into the responses that we're trying to calculate with our Monte Carlo code. How do we do that? Well, I'm assuming that everyone is familiar with the first order perturbation theory equation. Uh, I'm guessing that's actually probably not true. Some of you have probably never seen this equation before. You might not be familiar with the operator notation, but if you've taken some grad classes on transport theory, you might be familiar with this. This is just the equation that we use to compute sensitivity coefficients. A more simple version of that equation is this one. So in this equation, basically what we need to do is we have these brackets, which are inner products. That's just integral over all phase space, right? We, so to do that, we integrate energy from zero to infinity. We integrate space over the entire problem. We integrate over all solid angles. We integrate over everything, basically. So it's the inner product of the adjoint flux, phi star, times what ends up being a reaction rate. So sigma times phi is a reaction rate. So to get these sensitivity coefficients, we need two main pieces. We need phi star, the adjoint flux, and we need the reaction rates, the sigma times phi. The, the reaction rates are relatively easy to tally, but the adjoint flux is more challenging. So I think that there's probably a mix of grads and undergrads in this, this video. So y'all might, might not know what the adjoint flux is. The adjoint flux is also known as the importance, and it describes how much information a neutron contributes to a response. So the, there's, the response can be arbitrary, but it's how important that neutron is to whatever your response is. So say we care about eigenvalues, right? Eigenvalues are our response. A high importance neutron is one that, you know, maybe thermalizes and goes right into a fuel region and causes, causes a lot of fissions, right? Creating more fissions impacts the eigenvalue of the system. A low importance neutron actually might be one that is absorbed before it reaches the fuel. So it might not be able to create any fissions at all, therefore making no importance. Another version of a low importance neutron might be one that scatters and then leaks out of the system and just is gone, right? Just hits the vacuum boundary and bye-bye. So that's the general concept of importance. And most of the work, most of the uh, research I have to do is figuring out different ways to estimate that importance. 
figuring out different algorithms to estimate that. Uh, they're all pretty difficult, actually. Uh, some of them could be very, very elegant once you get them right, but that's the most challenging part of the work, estimating the adjoint flux. Once you have this adjoint flux, uh, then you can get some sensitivity coefficients and do lots of really cool things, which I'll talk about more later on in this presentation. Um, let's see, I was gonna say something. Oh yeah, I guess if you, if you enjoy doing a lot of applied mathematics and a lot of computer coding, this is a good area to get into, right? The applied mathematics allows you to figure out different and more clever ways to calculate these adjoints in the computer coding background allows you to do it in a way that's fast and efficient for the codes because a lot of the methods aren't fast or efficient right now. So Tsunami, the code that I used to work on, has several ways of computing sensitivity coefficients. They can do it using deterministic multigroup methods in Tsunami 1D, one-dimensional, in Tsunami 2D, two-dimensional. We also have Tsunami 3D, which uses Monte Carlo uh, calculations. It actually uses the Kino code, and then it computes sensitivity coefficients using Kino. Uh, my, my old boss, uh, for his dissertation, he developed the multigroup Tsunami 3D approach. And for my dissertation, I developed the Monte Carlo continuous energy forms of it, right? We always, we tend to want to use continuous energy Monte Carlo methods because there are fewer approximations in the data. We can use the continuous energy cross sections. You know, it's, it's the most accurate, uh, highest fidelity approach we have. So I developed some methods of doing that. In, uh, in Tsunami. Uh, the first method was, uh, is the iterative fission probability method, which uh, was developed by a guy named Horowitz way back in like 56, I think. Uh, but Forrest Brown and, and Brian Kudrowski implemented it into MCMP uh, a year or so before I started my work. So uh, they pioneered that method in a CE Monte Carlo code. And then I developed another method called clutch, which ends up being a little bit faster, a little bit more efficient on memory than IFP. So that's the scope of how we compute these sensitivity coefficients. Here's some cool plots that I like to geek out over for these sensitivity coefficients. You, I like the sensitivities because you really get to see the, uh, how different parts of the nuclear data impact the calculation. So here's a sensitivity of K effective to, due to the high energy oxygen 16 capture cross sections. So oxygen 16 has all these weird capture resonances at higher energies. And in the blue, you see just some multi-group approximation that doesn't really show you the structure of things. But in the red, if you use continuous energy methods and you make really, really small energy bins, you can really see the impact that all these resonances have on the eigenvalue. Here's another one that I like to geek, uh, geek out over. This is the plot of sensitivity coefficients right around that 6.67 EV capture resonance that uranium-238 has. This capture resonance is responsible for absorbing the majority of the slowing down uh, energy neutrons. I think for uh, HTGR, it absorbs like 60, 70% of the slowing down neutrons. But you can see on the top curve, Right, you see how the sensitivity goes up near these resonances, the main ones at 6.67 EV. And in the bottom one, you actually see the sensitivity for hydrogen, right? Uh, oh, no, no, I flipped it around. The bottom one is the sensitivity for uh, U-238, and the top one is the sensitivity for hydrogen. In the bottom one, you see a dip in the sensitivity right around the center of that resonance. Why is that? that is energy self-shielding, right? The resonance creates a flux depression, which means that the 238 cross sections don't really matter right at the top of the resonance because they're all just gonna get sucked up anyway. So you could double the cross section or divide it by two and it won't make a difference. The cross section is so, up, so incredibly high that it's going to suck up and gobble in any neutron no matter what. So, that's just a little bit of me geeking out about sensitivity coefficients, probably talking a little bit longer than I should about the, uh, the topic. So now I'll get into the part that is a little bit more relatable. So now that we have these, these fancy derivatives, what the heck can we use them for? So I'll go through four different applications of what we can use these sensitivities for. And it's, it's, I think these applications are really, really powerful. I think there's a lot of potential that still remains in the field. So I'm very excited to be working in this area. The first one is design optimization. So these sensitivities are just derivatives and you can use derivatives to try and optimize things. 
So one project that we did was trying to use these, uh, these sensitivities to optimize reaction rates and ratios of reaction rates. So one of my, one of the pieces of work I'm the most proud of is I figured out algorithms to compute uh, generalized sensitivity coefficients using continuous energy Monte Carlo. So before this, we could only get sensitivities for eigenvalues, which is really helpful for criticality safety, but we couldn't get sensitivities for these reaction rates or these reaction rate ratios. So say you want to tweak a capture to fission ratio, say you want to figure out the uncertainty in a fuel pin's peaking factor, which is just relative power, or say you want to figure out the amount of uncertainty in some multi-group collapse cross-section. Before this, before this work, you couldn't actually do that. So I figured out a new way to compute these sensitivities for these reaction rate ratios, and then I applied them to the HIFER reactor at Oak Ridge. So for those of you who don't know, HIFER is the high flux isotope reactor at Oak Ridge. It provides one of the highest intensity steady state neutron fluxes in the world. And the, the I, of course, in HIFER is isotope, which means HIFER is used to create a wide array of isotopes for all sorts of different applications, ranging from medicine to basic science to, uh, to security and DHS kinds of things. So one of the ones I usually talk about in these presentations uh, is nickel 63. So usually when I give this talk, it's because I'm going somewhere to give a seminar. So I, I usually have just gone through an airport. So now that we're in like the COVID world, I didn't go to an airport. I just woke up in that room and then came over to this room to work today. So, um, but so no airplane flights for me before this presentation. But usually when I go through the airports, I see nickel 63 being used for security applications. And nickel 63 is used in the little explosive detective machines they have. So if you ever, you know, if you ever win, win the lottery and the security person gets to, you know, wipe down your hands or wipe down your bags or whatever, they take those little circular, circular cotton swabs, they put them in that machine. That machine has nickel 63 in it. It uses it to try and detect high explosives. So that's one really cool application for high for isotopes. Um, another one is Einsteinium 254. Uh, Oak Ridge just got a Nobel Prize a year or so ago for creating Einsteinium 254. And what happened is they took Einsteinium 254 and then they took the stuff that they made at Oak Ridge, they shipped it off to uh, uh, over to Europe, I believe, and they hit it with, with atoms of calcium 40 and it turned into element 117. So they got, I think, five atoms of element 117 for the first time ever, so they made a new element and they got a Nobel Prize for it. So creating those super heavy elements at Oak Ridge at Heifer allows people to do all sorts of cool physics experiments elsewhere in the world. The last one I'll discuss and the one that we're going to focus on more today is Californium-252, which is used for, it's used as the startup source for most nuclear reactors. It's used for, uh, for neutron diffraction experiments, oil well logging experiments. It's just a high intensity neutron source. So if you stick it down like a, a, a pipe that someone's drilled into the ground to get oil, you can see when the neutrons from your source are being reflected by hydrogen in the oil, try and pinpoint where the oil is. It's also used more of something that's of more interest for this study. It's used as a, a neutron source for some safeguards and non-proliferation experiments. So, Californium-252 emits neutrons via spontaneous fission, and the energy spectrum of those neutrons is pretty similar to the spectrum of neutrons emitted from an HEU containing material. So, you know, we want to detect if, if the bad guys are shipping HEU somewhere, trying to hide it in some sort of shipping container or whatever. So we don't want to actually have HEU around there to do those experiments, right? That's, HEU comes with all sorts of guns and guards and guns and gates and all sorts of things. So if we use Californium-252 instead, we can mimic the signal for HEU without actually having HEU there. So Californium-252, super useful, but the problem is it's difficult to produce. So about 1% of all the isotopes they put into HIFER will actually make it up to Californium-252. That's because these, these uh, isotopes they, get, they go into the reactor in the curium range. So curium-244 to curium-248. They try and use the heavier curiums, heavier curiums if they can, but 
they don't have a whole lot of those. So that stuff goes in the reactor and it has to absorb between six and eight neutrons to reach californium. Each one of those neutron interactions has a chance of fissioning the heavy isotope. So basically all these heavy actinides are fissile. So what we were trying to do is we were trying to use these sensitivity coefficients from here to try and optimize this process, to try and optimize the capture to fission ratios so that we have more capture and less fission. So we got a uh, LDRD at Oak Ridge to do that, developed some cool capabilities, did some studies, and we saw that uh, we could get potentially large in improvements in the efficiency of Californium-252 production. This efficiency is defined as the amount of Californium made divided by the amount of feedstock destroyed. So as you get more and more efficient, you get into a divide by zero situation. Uh, so your efficiencies kind of balloon a lot. But we saw that with some simple design changes, maybe adding some filters or using a different geometry, we could, we could make California much more efficiently. One thing that I saw is that all the, all the sensitivities for all the, basically all the capture to fission ratios, their sensitivity to the density of the material was negative, which means that if you add more material, you'll get a less efficient process. So why is that happening? It was actually happening because the, the, the production targets were over self-shielded, right? We had so many isotopes in there that there's a big thermal flux depression. And if we added more, the depression would just get more intense. Whereas the fast neutrons don't care and they just stream through the target anyway. Fast neutrons are the ones that tend to cause fission more often and the thermal neutrons are the ones that tend to be captured more often. So our targets were actually being overly self-shielded. So if we just you know, use twice as many targets with 50% of the density and make no other design changes, uh, we can make, I can't see it on my screen here, I think it's about, yeah, like a 10% increase in the efficiency just by using slightly less dense targets. So that was a pretty cool uh, finding I saw. And they actually confirmed it previously and they didn't understand why. They'd done some tests on some preliminary filter materials for producing, for optimizing Californium. And they saw better Californium yields for all their tests like than they usually see in the production uh, targets, even the ones that are not filtered. And they saw better efficiency than they expected because all these tests use trace amounts of isotopes. Right, they didn't want to use a whole lot of, these isotopes are ver, very rare and very valuable. So they didn't want to use a whole lot of them in their, these simple tests. So they just use a very low concentration of them to save money and save isotopes. That low concentration meant it was less self-shielded. So it was more like the low density result and they got better than expected efficiency gains. So was, I thought this work was cool because it explained a, uh, a previously seen experimental result. So for the filter, a filter is just adding a, so say there's like a resonance, right? A big absorption resonance that destroys your isotopes, something like that, right? So say there's a big fission resonance. Well, to, to make a filter material, you might want to find another isotope that has a big capture resonance at that same energy or around that same energy so that it sucks up all the neutrons that would be destroying your otherwise valuable uh, heavy actinide isotopes. So you remove neutrons at the, the less efficient energies in just like a window and you allow neutrons to pass through that are at the more efficient energies. So that's what the filter material is. Okay, next application is uncertainty quantification. This is the first two applications are the, the kind of obvious ones and then the second ones are a little bit more subtle but also really cool. So here we have, uh, there's something known as the sandwich equation, which allows us to, to take our sensitivity coefficients and propagate them with the uncertainty in the cross sections to get the uncertainty in some sort of result. So the sensitivities are again, delta K over K over delta sigma over sigma. And then we also have this, this cove file, which is the covariance data. So cross section data have, they have covariance between the different cross sections. Right, you might use one, cross, one isotope to calibrate a detector that's used to measure cross-section for a different isotope. So there's a correlation between the uncertainty in all these isotopes. 
So with the sandwich equation, you can propagate that uncertainty uh, and get the uncertainty in whatever response you're looking, you're looking at. I added the units down there to try and make that a little bit more clear. And this kind of uncertainty propagation is really important. It's uh, on Wednesday, I said that there's a 1% uncertainty in K for fast reactors, half, for, half a percent thermal reactors. So this is, these are the equations that allow you to get those numbers. This is really important when you're making a new NDEF evaluation, for example, you're making new nuclear data, right? What, what they do when they do that is they look at the, they, there's a big library of these critical experiments. And when they come out with a new data library, they will model all the experiments using, you know, using MCMP and using that new data, and they compare it to the, the measured experiment results. And they should be pretty close to each other. They should be within two or three standard deviations, right? This equation is how we get those standard deviations. How large are the, is one, one sigma, right? This equation gives us that. So with this equation and with all those different simulation results, we can do chi-squared tests and other st statistical analyses and see whether or not our new nuclear data evaluation overall improves the accuracy of our, uh, of our codes. So that's really useful. It's also nice for trying to improve, uh, tr to trying to target nuclear data needs. So right, say I had some sort of application, uh, I care about which capture to fission ratio in my Californium 252 production, which capture to fission ratio has the most uncertainty, right? I could do that kind of data propagation and say, hey, curium-247 has the most uncertainty, so maybe we should improve that, that isotope and not curium-245 because that has a much lower uncertainty. It gets even better than that, actually. So these uncertainties that you get are also uh, isotope dependent and reaction type dependent and energy dependent too, right? So you see, what contributes the most uncertainty to that curium-244 capture to fission ratio? Obviously, there's capture and fission for curium-244 that contribute uncertainty, but some other things contribute uncertainty too, like aluminum, because HIFR has aluminum fuel in it. And then also on the right-hand side, we see as a function of energy where these uncertainties lie. So you can take this and find your favorite nuclear data scientist and say, hey, this one resonance right here that's the bad guy. That's the one that makes the most uncertainty. If you have to go back and remeasure something, measure that one. So it's really helpful for identifying and really targeting nuclear data needs. Oh, this was a fun project. This was a. Uh, this wasn't really funded. This was more of a weekend warrior project. Uh, but you can also use these sensitivities to get uncertainty in your multi-group cross sections, right? In that equation a couple of slides ago, you just say sigma two equals one. So then your response is a multi-group average cross-section. So there is a, a method that came out of MIT for computing diffusion coefficients in Monte Carlo codes. And these diffusion coefficients were extremely, extremely accurate. And the method, it, it, it relied on the definition of diffusion coefficients that relies on their migration area, which is basically a measure of how far they travel before uh, the neutron gets absorbed or removed from the energy group. So it's a very intuitive approach for getting the diffusion coefficients, relatively simple. There's challenges with it in other ways, but, but I wanted to see how much uncertainty we had in those diffusion coefficients. So I went back to the drawing board, figured out how to get sensitivities for these diffusion coefficients and put it into tsunami and got the data induced uncertainties. And I saw that the, so, Group one is fast, group two is thermal. So the fast diffusion coefficient had a large deal of uncertainty, more uncertainty than almost anything else in the problem. That uncertainty was due to the uncertainty from the U238 inelastic scattering cross-section, which is just hugely uncertain. So what, would you, what the heck would you use this stuff for? Well, if you're running PARCS, for example, right? PARCS uses multi-group average cross-sections and it's coupled with a coupled with multi-physics tools and it gives you, allows you to simulate reactor transients, right? So you take this, these uncertainty bounds for the nuclear data, you randomly perturb the input cross sections and you get a spectrum of parks results that show you, okay, my peak uh, fuel temperature during this transient is this with error bars of this. So you get a distribution of the 
you know, design limiting parameters like the peak fuel temperature. So that's a cool little application, I thought. But anyway, moving on, the, uh, so that's the kind of more obvious applications. The next two are, are a little bit harder, but I think they're really, really cool. They have lots of potential. So I'll give you guys a break from me constantly talking and rehydrate here for a second. So, sorry, I was supposed to hold that label out while I drank. This, uh, this presentation is sponsored by Sprouts Orange Sparkling Water, caffeine free and unsweetened too. So. I prefer the orange flavor, but to each of their own. Anyway, with that intermission aside, one other thing you can use these sensitivity coefficients for is to is for benchmark experiment selection. So say I want to validate a code, right? I want to prove to myself that my code is working right and that it's getting the right answer, right? That compared to some application that I know my code will work if it says k effective is going to be 0.95 for some you know some spent fuel shipping cask that k effective is not actually going to be 1.05 and my fuel goes super critical and i have a criticality accident so how would you go about selecting a benchmark experiment that is similar to your application how do you select a benchmark experiment that covers the sources of uncertainty uh, the same sources of uncertainty as your application Right, if you're trying to benchmark uh, like a fast HEU system, you probably want to use fast HEU benchmarks. You want to benchmark a thermal system that has deuterium coolant, use a benchmark with thermal spectrum and deuterium. But if you get into intermediate spectrum or MOX fuel or systems that are more and more complicated, it's hard to know if your benchmarks are going to cover the same sources of uncertainty as your application. So what you, what you can do is take our old friend the sandwich equation from before. This was the equation we used to propagate the uncertainty in our cross sections. And instead of using sensitivities from the same thing in both those sensitivity vectors, the first one is the sensitivities for system one. Maybe that's my application, my spent fuel shipping cask I want to build. And, and you combine it with sensitivities from R2. Maybe that's my set of sensitivities for a, a benchmark experiment, excuse me, a benchmark experiment that's been performed. And what you can do is you can find the fraction of uncertainty, the C sub K, that's shared between system one and system two. Now this is, uh, the C sub K is basically like a Pearson's correlation coefficient, if you guys remember that from statistics, but it's just the fraction of uncertainty shared between the two systems. If C sub K is one, they share all the exact same sources of uncertainty, which means they have the same fissile isotopes, they have the same neutron spectra, they have the same structural materials, they're basically identical. Uh, these sensitivity coefficients are like a fingerprint for the system. And if they overlap completely, then you can say, yes, this, finger, this, system, this system's fingerprint is the same as that other system, therefore, the uncertainty in the cross sections that we have for our benchmark experiment where we observe you know the bias in the eigenvalue because we performed the experiment that same bias should be seen in our application so you can predict what kind of bias you get in your your calculation result from your you can you get just justification to extrapolate the bias from your benchmarks to your application case to the thing you want to build so they've uh, they've used this in I just said that, so they have used this in, uh, in many places before. So this has been in use since before I got to Oak Ridge. Uh, it's a great way of licensing uh, spent fuel shipping casks, any kind of uh, system that might go critical that you wanna ensure doesn't go critical. So it's been used by the NRC, DOE. Uh, they've used it for can-do reactors. Uh, they've used it in uh, this, this Swedish used fuel repository used it actually. And they, uh, they hired a bunch of the tsunami guys to go out there and give them a training course. And unfortunately, I drew the short straw so I didn't have to go out there, didn't get a free trip to Sweden to go uh, teach them how to use tsunami, which would have been fun. Uh, I said that it would have been fun and I was kind of disappointed I didn't go on that trip until they told me that the, uh, their hosts took 
the two two people who went uh, out on a uh, ice skating adventure on a lake and the ice skating adventure was five or so miles long and I don't think I can go ice skating for five or so feet so I certainly I certainly would have uh, I would have ceased being a human and reverted into a big pile of bruises after that adventure so I'm glad I didn't go on that one but it would have been fun anyway except for that so this stuff has been used in all sorts of places it's a great way of identifying which benchmarks are similar for an application. I think there's a lot of potential to use this for next generation reactors too, because we don't really, yeah, we know what systems are similar to an, a PWR, but we don't really know how similar our benchmarks are to an HTGR or some weird small modular reactor or a micro reactor design. So there's going to be licensing challenges there to, to say to, to the NRC, yes, we know how this reactor will perform, because of this set of experiments we have. Experiments are becoming more and more expensive and more and more difficult to perform. So we need to use the data that we have as best as possible. And this allows us to do that. So, all right, moving on. The last one, the last area I'll talk about is data assimilation. So I think this is a really exciting area, but what is data assimilation? So data assimilation, you get data, you combine it with the Borg, and you get data that has been assimilated, right? Uh, no, not quite. Not quite that, but I, I enjoy having a Star Trek reference in there. I hope you guys enjoyed, it, enjoyed being nerds with me too. Data assimilation. So the premise behind the data assimilation, the kind of fundamental theory of tsunami, is that if we use a really high fidelity code, like continuous energy Kino or MCMP or Serpent, right? We use this high fidelity code that uses, uses continuous energy cross sections and it, we simulate some sort of system, we get a reference value. We also have a reference value from the experiment that we measured, right? That's over here. I guess it's also on the screen too, but there's a, a gap there between the calculated result and the measured result. That gap is known as the bias. It's the computational bias. It's, it's basically a measure of how off the code is. Yeah, live long and prosper, yep. Uh, so if our, if our code is a high fidelity Monte Carlo tool, then there should be almost no approximations in it, right? And then that bias, that difference there, should be due to uncertainty or errors in the nuclear data. So if we were to calibrate the nuclear data, say we wiggle it here, we wiggle it, a little more. Oh, we over wiggled. Oh, wiggle back. Okay. Now we've uh, we've changed our data in a way that improves the agreement between our code and our experiment. And that set of adjusted data is really the calibrated nuclear data. It's actually what the data should be based on all of our measurements. When you do that, you want to make sure that you don't adjust the data by, you know, ten standard deviations, right? You want to adjust the data want to adjust all the data by a realistic amount. And there's a ton of data to adjust. So there's generally lots of ways to adjust it to get to that. So the code called Surfer, uh, I have an awesome logo up there. It's another scale code. It does this. Uh, you, you give Surfer experiment results and code results, and it, cal it wiggles the cross sections using sensitivity coefficients until it gets things to match up. When I say it wiggles the cross sections, it actually, it solves a big matrix that says, that says what the cross section value should be. It doesn't like iteratively re-simulate it using different cross sections. That would take forever. It actually just finds a set of re recommended adjustments to the cross sections that maximizes agreement with your experiments. So uh, another sprouts sparkling water break. Okay, so here's a plot of C over E's for a bunch of criticality experiments. The C over E ratio is the ratio of the, the computer code calculated value and the experimentally measured value. And we want those ratios to be kind of close to one. And before we do the adjustment, we have the red data points. They're kind of a little bit all over the place. After we do the adjustment, we have the blue data points, which are all have been adjusted right to one. So this really, really improved the agreement between our code and our experiments. 
and when I say that this data assimilation consistently adjusts the nuclear data, I mean that all the experiments see the same adjustment, right? It doesn't raise the plutonium-239 fission cross-sections by 5% in one case, and then lower it by 10% for another case. The, the cross-sections get the same energy-dependent adjustments for all the experiments. And out of that, we get the cross-section adjustments. Here, they're shown in a multi-group format. So the code says, hey, I think that your plutonium-239 and gamma cross-sections, the kind of pinkish, magenta-ish, purplish one, uh, second to the bottom in the, the legend, at those higher energies, it needs about a 15, 16% increase in that cross-section to maximize agreement with our experiments. So it's really guiding you to saying, hey, the cross-section should be changed to maximize agreement, and here's ex exactly how they should be changed. So this is really helpful for a nuclear data perspective because you can hand this to your favorite nuclear data scientist and say, hey, go back and look at this one right here again and look at it in this specific energy range. And they've done that a bit before and they've actually, sure enough, in I think NF7-1, they made changes that the Oak Ridge people had been kind of requesting for years based on this surfer code. Uh, from here, you can take these these cross-section adjustments and apply them to nuclear data for future cases and figure out what kind of bias you're likely to see in some application system that you're trying to design and build. But I'm more focused lately on the nuclear data side of things. And when I say that, I mean, I would, I'm interested in figuring out how we can take these multi-group adjustments and use them to actually improve the data. So if we compare the adjustments in dark green for some some sample case to the uranium-238 cross-sections in light green, right? Let's look at these, let's see how they match up. So let's zoom in. The adjustments to the cross-sections that SURFER recommends, they're all these stepwise functions, right? So stepwise function increase or decrease or something along those lines. Whereas the nuclear data itself, it's nuclear data cannot and should not be stepwise, right? It's continuous. We have these features due to absorption and resonances or whatever kind of resonance we have. It could be a scatter or fission resonance too. But the nuclear data is continuous. So if we were trying to actually adjust our continuous energy data for real using these, using what we get out of SURFER, what we'd get wouldn't make sense, right? You'd have a, instead of a smooth curve, you'd have a curve that goes kind of like this and then jumps up and then behaves in some different way. You'd have discontinuities in your nuclear data, which we don't want. So how should you adjust this data? Well, these resonance parameters are actually, they're actually what NDEF actually measures. So they measure like the, if the energy level of the resonance is over here or over here or wherever, and they measure the, the width of the resonance. Is it you know shorter and wider or skinnier and taller? So, this is getting into my current research. What we could do is instead of getting sensitivities for our multi-group cross-sections, use some chain rule to get sensitivities for these resonance parameters, for the stuff that nuclear, these are the evaluated nuclear data parameters. The stuff that nuclear data folks actually measure, the, the things that, they, that go into their, you know, our matrix theory models that they actually measure and evaluate and put into NDEF. So if we get sensitivities for these resonance parameters instead, then we could try adjusting those guys directly rather than fiddling with some multi-group cross-sections in a way that's not realistic. And then from there, we can take the adjusted resonance parameters and then put them into Enjoy or Ampex or whatever nuclear data processing code you want to use and get a real new library of continuous energy nuclear data that has been adjusted with no discontinuities that makes all of our calculations more accurate. So you calibrate your nuclear data using the using experimental benchmark measurements, and then you get a new a new and improved set of continuous energy data. So that's uh, it's actually funded by this consortium. I have a student named Matt Lazarik who's working on it. So uh, come up to any of our consortium meetings if you happen to be at any of them and ask me or Matt about these things. Uh, we'd be happy to talk about it. I think it's a really cool project. 
I have uh, two other students who are at Los Alamos that's funded by a subcontract with Los Alamos doing other Monte Carlo work. So the first student is working on uh, fission multiplicity uh, measurements and calculations. So if you have a, actually, I guess on Wednesday, I talked about doing a Monte Carlo simulation using the K effective mode, right? The power iteration mode mm -hmm. and using a fixed source mode. No, I'm gonna, We're not gonna get anywhere. I think someone is not muted. I would make sure that you all mute if you can. Okay, I think I'm unmuted. Maybe, can I get a, okay, cool. Thank you, John. Thank you for the thumbs up. All right, so. I got a question about OpenMC in the chat. I think I'll go through that at the uh, at the end of the, the presentation. I only have a couple, like five more slides left, so I'm getting close to uh, releasing you from this suffering. Anyway, uh, one of my students who's working on my Los Alamos subcontract is working on uh, multiplicity measurements, multipl multiplicity calculations. So you can do Monte Carlo code using eigenvalue mode or using fixed source mode. With fixed source mode, if you have a fissile system and you allow fission to occur, you get these chains of, of fission neutrons. And if your eigenvalue is equal to one, then you get an unending chain of fission neutrons because you have criticality. One neutron creates another one, the process goes on forever. Uh, so you can't do this kind of calculation for a critical system. You have to use the k-effective mode. But if you have a fixed source calculation mode for a system that's close to critical, say k effective is 0.99, right? Then you get, you get lots of chains of neutrons and they're very, very long. Uh, so they really, really increase your runtime, which can be a problem. But you can't really use the k effective mode, right? That, is, that calculation, even though it's almost critical, it's still being driven by an external neutron source. So if you do it using k effective mode, and you ignore the external neutron source and your calculation is not really right. If you model it using the external neutron source, you get the right answer, but it might take you know, a factor of a thousand times as long to get that right answer. So this student is looking at different ways to try and simulate those problems, make that uh, kind of methodology more efficient and more doable. He's also been incorporating some high fidelity physics models, which is uh, which are very useful for the kind of correlated fission measurements that uh, a lot of people at Michigan uh, do research on. So that stuff is going into MCMP, which is also useful. I have another student on that Los Alamos subcontract who is looking at sensitivity-based uh, validation methods for criticality safety. So in criticality safety, we care a lot about things called USLs, which are the upper subcriticality limits. So how close to critical can you get and still say stay safely subcritical? So this student is using, she's using sensitivity coefficients to try and predict these USL values. And she saw some really interesting behavior when she looked at these, uh, these values. She was using the whisper code within MCMP to do this. And she, she, took a, she took a couple of systems, right? So here she has a system that has a fast metal plutonium sphere a big thermal plutonium solution. So two kinds of, uh, the sprouts water is coming in handy. So the thermal, thermal solution and the fast sphere. So it's a heterogeneous system. And she looked at the USL that the code gave for using only thermal and the only fast, uh, only, only the thermal solution, only the fast sphere. And she looked at the USL for both of them combined. And she saw interesting behavior based on like, which one you use and based on their, their separation distance in the problem. So just looking at one of the, the data points, so look at, looking at the one with the 50 centimeter separation, the USL for the entire system is the little orange star and there's a higher USL for only the fast plutonium sphere and a lower USL for only the thermal solution. So the question is, which one of these USLs is right? Which one should we use? Uh, should you use the one for the entire system? That would make sense because that's the system you're looking at. But the USL for the only thermal solution part of it, the little green triangle, is lower, meaning it's more conservative. So do you use a USL for the entire system? 
do you use the USL that only has part of, this, of the system but is more conservative, right? Which one do you use? The more conservative one or the less conservative one that is more accurate maybe? If you use the more conservative one that only models part of the system, you could easily get into a spiral of dissecting the problem into different parts and looking for which one has the most conservative USL. So she's, she's working on trying to understand this relationship between this USL kind of wiggling that goes on and trying to figure out which USL is the right one to use for these problems, trying to get a reference USL. So that's one, uh, that another interesting project. Another one is a uh, NEUP award I got, uh, started this past year, so it's just entering year two. And this one is trying to develop some depletion sensitivity theory capabilities. So, and it's trying to measure cross sections or infer cross sections for things that you might not be able to measure directly. So at Oak Ridge, uh, one thing that they do is they sometimes produce plutonium-238, right? Plutonium-238 is the, uh, it's a, a long-term heat generator, which is used as a fuel source in, uh, in like uh, RTGs, in uh, the actual, the Voyager uh, mission to Mars, not the Voyager, mission to uh, the Delta Quadrant or the Alpha Quadrant or wherever. Uh, that's Star Trek. We already made the Star Trek joke. I'm still getting pulled back into Star Trek jokes, so uh, live long and prosper. But plutonium-238 is a very convenient heat source and energy source that that Hyfer makes for NASA missions. The problem is that, well, the way that they make plutonium-238 is they irradiate neptunium-237. It captures a neutron, becomes neptunium-238, which eventually decays into plutonium-238. So neptunium-237 cross-sections are pretty well known, right? It's just, they're shown here in the blue. You have a nice resolved resonance region, an unresolved resonance region, one over V region, fast region, everything you would expect from resonances. Here are the cross-sections for neptunium-238. It's just a, just a line, right? These are the NF70 cross sections. Uh, the 71 cross sections are better. They have like one resonance, but in general, the neptunium 238 cross sections are really, really poorly known. The neptunium 238 cross sections are not actually just that straight line. They should have the same kind of data structure, the same kind of physics features as neptunium 237, but we just can't measure the cross sections for neptunium 238. It has like a 2.1 day half-life, so it's really hard to, to make it and then isolate it and then you'll measure it in enough time for those isotopes to still be there. So we just have to kind of guess what the data is for neptunium-238. So that is that actually introduces a lot of uncertainty in, our, in the high for plutonium-238 production calculations, more so in the heat generation actually, which is the limiting constraint when you produce plutonium-238 it generates a lot of heat. So how could we calibrate those cross sections for neptunium-238? We can't measure those cross sections directly, but we can, we could do that kind of thing where we look at the plutonium-238 yields that we get and then try and wiggle the neptunium-238 cross sections uh, until we get a yield that matches what we see. It's just the same thing as wiggling the data before, but now we're using a depletion calculation, right? An activation transmutation kind of calculation. Uh, so, but to do that, we need sensitivities for the isotope number density as a function of these cross sections. So that's known as depletion perturbation theory. Uh, the math behind it is really complicated. So I've been uh, reviewing it with a student lately and it's, uh, it's tough for sure, but it, it allows for some promising capabilities if we can pull it off, right? We can calibrate this, this data that we can't measure directly, not just for this cross-section, but there's fission yield data and branching data, decay data, all sorts of stuff that we have difficulty measuring directly that we could calibrate with a depletion tool because we can measure the, the isotopes for everything once it's over very well, but with, we can't measure the stuff in between. And with these sensitivities, we could see how changing the, the physics and the cross sections for those intermediate steps affects our final result there. You can use it to calibrate that data. So that's a, a really cool uh, capability that we're working on right now. And uh, 
last projects I'll discuss, I have two other projects with Sandia along the same lines of using data assimilation. So we're using data assimilation to try and improve some low fidelity, low energy photon and electron data. And we're also trying to use these data assimilation Bayesian statistics methods to infer some Z-machine plasma properties, like the temperature that the plasma is burning at. So some cool stuff, lots of data calibration, lots of sensitivity coefficients, lots of fun algorithms. It's kind of a niche area, but hopefully I provided a decent overview of the, the work I'm doing. Uh, if you'd like to know some more about it, please feel free to contact me. My email is up there. Um, and with that, I'll be happy to take any questions you guys have. Actually, I do have, oh, okay. I have a question right here. Oh, a couple questions. Okay, so I have a question about the open MOC code from MIT. Uh, Mohammed says that he used Enjoy to prepare the input for the cross sections for it. And he's done lattice physics uncertainty calculations for PWRs. What kind of codes do I recommend for benchmarking or VNV of uh, open MOC? So of course I always recommend using Monte Carlo codes to, uh, to benchmark. Uh, if you're doing a, a traditional light water reactor, CASMO could be a good benchmark. Uh, there's also Polaris and Triton and Newt, actually Polaris and Newt are the Oak Ridge codes. They're 2D uh, kinds of lattice codes. Uh, and Newt is actually part of Tsunami 2D. So you can get sensitivity coefficients from Tsunami 2D, use that for that same kind of data adjustment exercise that we've used before. So that's one option. Let's see. Another question, what causes the USL to be almost the same at 50 centimeters apart, as well as 130 centimeters apart? Yeah, that is a very good question. We're not exactly sure why those USLs have that behavior. So, well, we, we, we kind of are and we kind of aren't. So what WHISPER does is it, it uses those C, those C sub Ks, those similarity coefficients, the like Pearson correlation coefficients, to identify several benchmarks to use when you're determining your USL. And it's a, it's a parametric method, so it basically just looks at the most conservative result from those, that library of benchmarks that you have. So what happens as you change the separation distance is you change the, the neutronic characteristics. So the energy, the flux spectrum, uh, which sensitivities are bigger or smaller, is it more fast or more thermal, you change stuff like that. So based on changing the spectrum, it changes the cases that go into this library. So this one will get pumped off. This one will get bumped off. They'll be replaced by other ones. So this library's, the contents of this library changes. So then your most conservative case in that library changes a little bit too. There's other things that go into it, but that's the, the short answer. So it's basically because the stuff that's in the library changes, why those things, why the points change from separation distance to separation distance. Why that behavior is like that? Why is this compressed sandwich thing? This like double U shape? Uh, well, not, not, a, not a W, w but a two U shape. It's like a hyperbola or something. But we don't exactly know why it has that shape. And that's something we're trying to figure out. Are there any other questions? Let's see, if you, I guess if you're interested in finding out some more stuff about this, uh, this area is not very well uh, published. Uh, there's not many good reference documents. So uh, I have a research gate, you're welcome to Google me. I have all my, pretty much all my articles on there so you can read them. They talk about all these sensitivity coefficients. The MCMP group has a reference collection that's online. They have all the stuff in there too, so that's, very convenient. So between those, those couple of sources, you can uh, find some references. I actually, I have a, uh, so one of, this, one of the big sensitivity guys, his name was Mark Williams. Unfortunately, he just passed away in uh, 2018 from uh, liver cancer. 
but he was, he's the nicest guy in the world, really, really approachable and just blazingly smart, but he didn't show it. He was just really nice, really easy to work with. But he, uh, he published a, a bunch of work on this, or he, he did a bunch of work on this stuff back in the 70s, which was actually right in the like year before and the year after he defended his PhD. So there's a couple of takeaways from that, which is number one, you might think that you're only a grad student or only a PhD student, but you can still do work that people are still citing to this day, right? You can still make a really big impact. Any research can, so don't be discouraged. You all have lots of potential in you. And Mark certainly showed that that was possible. The other nice takeaway is that, uh, well, the, the, the funny part of that story is that uh, Mark did all this work in the 70s and kind of just stopped working on it. So it's hard to get, it's hard to find that work. Uh, a lot of those resources aren't online. So one day Oak Ridge was throwing out this big library of books and stuff. So I saved a big collection of all the ANS transactions all the way from 1956 to uh, today. And I have it in my office now at UNM. So I saved that collection just to get Mark Williams' uh, old publications on that stuff. The publications that are hidden that aren't online at all. So I have all that stuff in my office now. It, it looks really cool, it's just a big thing of books, but it, it, it really brings the office together, I guess. It looks really nice. So there's unfortunately a shortage of publications on this stuff, uh, but you can find stuff through my research gate and through the MCMD page. Okay, all right. I explained filters at the beginning of the presentation. Yeah, so the idea with the, the filters are you want to remove neutrons from unfavorable energies and allow neutrons from favorable energies to pass through, right? So if, if curium-246 has a big fission resonance, right? Interactions with neutrons there cause it to fission. You want to move neutrons outside of that energy range, right? So you can do that by absorbing the neutrons, right? Say you have a, another isotope that has a big capture resonance there, right? You can use that to kind of depress the flux so that the fission resonance doesn't really see as many neutrons. So you, you strategically depress the flux in some energies and you, uh, you try not to, do, to decrease it in the helpful energies. Just like a little window that lets the right neutrons in and doesn't let the wrong ones in. All right, any other questions? Well, thank you all for uh, coming to my talk. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I guess, I don't know if anyone else is here to give a pitch for next week's, but yeah, I think some of the co-hosts are here for next week. So if you guys wanna jump in and do the sales pitch for, for next week, that's fine with me. But other than that, I hope to see you guys around at MTV meetings and ANS conferences. And let me know if you have any questions about my work. Thanks.